we are indeed fortunate uh, to have uh, Dr. Matthew Miller here. Uh, he is, is, uh, is a star in his own right, and I'll tell you a little bit more about him in just a minute. Uh, Dr. Miller will discuss uh, how we might establish a public health framework for addressing gun violence as well as const constructing a research agenda. Dr. Miller, who actually was on one of the first program, the first program we had on public health, uh, uh, a public health approach to preventing gun violence in Philadelphia three years ago uh, this month. Uh, and uh, uh, he is uh, one of the foremost experts in injury and violence prevention in the country. Uh, has his, uh, he has both a medical degree from Yale University uh, School of Medicine, a, a Master's of Public Health from Harvard uh, School of Public Health, a uh, Doctor of Science, that's the, uh, the advanced PhD or the advanced doctorate uh, uh, in health policy from Harvard uh, School of Public Health. He is a professor of health science and epidemiology at Northeastern University, adju adjunct professor of epidemiology at Harvard School of Public Health, and the co-director of the Harvard Injury Control Research Center. Uh, Dr. Miller's research approaches both intentional and unintentional injury as causes of death and morbidity that can be prevented using an injury prevention paradigm. We are incredibly lucky to have Dr. Miller uh, with us today. And now please welcome Dr. Matthew Miller. Thank you, David. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here this afternoon, and um, I'm going to uh, talk to you about uh, what is framed as a public health approach to preventing firearm violence. Um, the term a public health approach is almost like a shibboleth that we use when writing grants or submitting papers for review. You, you define the problem. You identify risk and protective factors, you develop uh, uh, prevention strategies, and then you, you um, promote widespread adoption. That is the public health approach on the CDC website. It's an approach to solving lots of different problems. Um, a simpler definition that, that I prefer is to try to make it easy for people to stay healthy and more difficult for them to become, become sick or injured. There are five key elements that my friend and colleague David Hemingway and I wrote about a few years ago to uh, a public health approach. The first is that it's population-based. It doesn't focus so much on individuals, but on uh, large groups of people. Uh, it also focuses on prevention upstream, if possible. A public health approach, a third element is that it takes into account, borrowing from uh, human factors engineering, a systems approach. It tries to create systems in which it's difficult, not easy, to make mistakes or behave inappropriately. Uh, and if you do make mistakes or do behave in inappropriately, those errors are buffered from becoming injury or serious injury. Uh, another key feature of a public health approach is that it's broad and inclusive. You want to include as many groups, as many people, as many ideas as possible. It examines all sorts of interventions. It sees which works, those that don't, it discards and goes on. And uh, it, it's broad and includes everything from changing social norms to passing new laws and to engaging as many people as possible, whether they be in the gun manufacturing industry, in gun stores, in uh, churches, mosques, or synagogues, or even in lawyers' offices. Okay. Um, it, uh, focuses less on blame um, and more on a shared responsibility. And a great example that sort of instantiates the public health approach is the enormous success in reducing the um, toll of motor vehicle fatalities over the past half century. So most motor vehicle crashes are due to driver error, people driving drunk, people driving too fast, being distracted, being tired being angry, uh, and, e and most motor vehicle fatalities are actually uh, associated with people acting deliberately uh, in a way that is unlawful, speeding, 
uh, driving drunk, running red lights. So um, given that most motor vehicle related fatalities and crashes are um, traceable to individual behavior, it would make sense that you'd want to focus on the individual. And for years and years, for decades and decades, that was the case. We tried to educate people, put them in through driver's ed programs, and to enforce traffic laws to little, uh, to little avail. And then in around 1950 or thereabouts, um, physicians uh, started to ask a different question. Instead of asking who caused the crash, was he drunk? They started asking a different question, which is what caused the injury? This is a picture of a, a, a car, I think, from the 1950s, and you can see that steering wheel. It's a beautiful, it's a beautiful object, but when, uh, when the car collides with another car or immovable object, it becomes a spear that impales the driver. The glass in that car is not shatterproof. There are no airbags, there are no seat belts. And when people uh, uh, got into motor vehicle crashes, they were ejected from the car, their arteries were lacerated by the broken glass, uh, and, uh, and there were trees lining highways. It was really pretty, you know, but when you lost control, you didn't roll into a ditch, instead you smashed into a tree. So recognizing that it's a lot easier and more effective um, to alter the environment than it is to try to change human behavior. That's a central observation uh, that led to a, an 85% reduction in motor vehicle fatalities. We still try to get people not to uh, drive fast, but we do so in ways that, uh, that compel certain types of behavior. So we have bot dots. In case you're tired and you're going off out of the lane, you're reminded by the bot dots that something had happened because they vibrate. Um, we have uh, we, we, we don't have trees lining highways any longer. And we have airbags, we have collapsible steering columns, cars that accordion to absorb the energy. And m today, most traffic experts don't think that drivers are any better than they were back in the 50s, even though we've seen an 85% reduction in motor vehicle fatalities per mile driven. We just think that the cars are safer and the environment is safer. Um, and he, here you can see some of the examples that I've mentioned, the bot dots, the airbags, the speed bumps. One of the um, first sort of essential features to understanding what was happening was creating a data system uh, to see what was going on when, when people died of motor vehicle fatalities. And a lot of the, the, the information about the collapsible steering columns and the, and, the, and the shatterproof glass came from looking at what happened in particular uh, uh, in, in fatal crashes. We now, for the past, uh, since around 2005 or so, have a comparable but much smaller system, not yet national, called the National Violent Death Reporting System to look at firearm-related fatalities. Firearm homicides and non-firearm homicides, firearm suicides, non-firearm suicides, and uh, unintentional firearm deaths. We learned from, uh, from good data systems, for example, with respect to car crashes, that 16-year-old drivers are a lot worse than 19-year-old drivers, but they're, they're even, even less safe when they've got other teenagers in the car, and they're even less safe when they're driving at night. You know, those data were available in the fatal uh, 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 surveillance system, and after looking at those data, we had the uh, empirical basis to pass laws so that we don't have 16-year-olds driving at night and we don't have them driving with other teenagers. The same sort of uh, data-driven policies are possible using the National Violent Death Reporting System. And uh, I'm gonna show you uh, a few pieces of information that have been, that, 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 that could inform uh, policy. So what, what do we know about violent firearm-related childhood deaths? Here's a table um, which indicates, uh, it shows you these are all unintentional firearm deaths, fire, so-called firearm accidents. Um, there are, uh, if you see, among two to four-year-olds, there are a lot of kids who are dying with self-inflicted. Only 29% had other inflicted injuries. A lot of them are able to pull the trigger on a gun. This is not something that, uh, that we had known before these data came out. We thought it was too hard to pull a trigger if you weren't a five-year-old kid. 
but and you can see that it's only starting at around the age of 11 or so that the firearm accidents were taking place in people's homes, in, in other, in friends' homes. So what are the policies that, um, that made sense uh, given these data? One is that you need to child-proof the guns. You know, you can't, you can't gun-proof your child. A two- to four-year-old can pull the trigger. You need to make it harder uh, to pull that trigger. And for 10-year-olds, uh, you need to speak to the, your, their friends' families to find out, do they have guns in their home? Okay. Here's another finding from the National Violent Death Reporting System. When, um, it, when looking at the circumstances surrounding these, these unintentional firearm accidents, the great majority of them occurred when the magazine was no longer in the firearm and someone pulled the trigger thinking that it would not discharge, but it did. Now we can blame the parents for not teaching their child or the child for not knowing better. That would be one approach. But it's probably better to try to solve the problem, in this case technically, by having some sort of magazine safety lock. You know how much film in the past, I'm dating myself, you, we would always know when you're coming to the end of a, the role, a roll of film because you knew how many pictures were left. We don't know that with firearms. Okay. Um, here's another uh, set of data that I wanted to share with you from the precursor to the National Violent Death Reporting System. We're currently looking in the National Violent Death Reporting System to try to identify the source of the gun used in suicides among children, whether the gun was locked, um, or loaded. This is in the precursor to that system um, in which you can see that uh, among the, the, the 44 children um, who died by firearm, uh, unintentional firearm death, 82% used a gun that belonged to a family member. So when you're looking at where these guns come from, where are children getting the guns that they're using to kill themselves, they're using guns for the most part in their own homes, which is true as well among adults. Okay. Here's a, a finding, not yet published, um, uh, but that I wanted to share with you about from a random digit dial, from a, a nationally representative survey that we conducted back in 2015. What we asked um, a, a sample of a representative sample of a U.S. adults was whether they thought a gun in the home increased the risk of suicide, and you can see in the highlighter at the bottom only 15 percent of U.S. adults. 15% thought that a gun increased the risk of suicide. The evidence supporting the relationship between a gun in the home and a substantial increase in the risk of suicide is stronger you know, for, for the gun-suicide relationship than it is for any other sort of relationship. The epidemiologic data is overwhelming. I'll show you some of that. Here are more data from the survey. This, this shows you how parents uh, store their guns. The first thing to notice uh, is that um, if you look at the percentage of all homes that have guns, you can't really see it here, but about the same percent, one in three homes have guns in the United States as a whole. It doesn't matter if you have a child, still one in three homes have guns. If you have a child with mental illness, you're just as likely to have a gun as if you have a child without mental illness. And if you have a child with mental illness, you're no more likely to store your gun safely. The American Academy of Pediatrics recommends that if you're going to keep a gun in your home, in your home with a child, you need to store it unloaded and locked up, separate from the ammunition. In our survey in 2015, only one in three parents stored their guns loaded, uh, stored their guns unloaded and locked up. And it didn't make a difference whether your child had a mental health illness or not. Two out of three kids with mental health problems living in homes with guns are living in homes where the guns are not secured. So what are some of the policies that would stem from that? Well, one would be to try to develop a technology that would make it impossible for anyone but the owner, for example, to fire the gun, so-called smart guns, or personalized guns. Uh, another would be, and it's simpler, and something we can do right away, is to encourage parents to store their guns safely and to learn how to communicate that risk in a way that is effective. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about that, and then my friends and colleagues, uh, 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 Megan Rainey and Emmy Betts, um, are going to d do it up real nice later. <laughs> uh, uh, okay. 
Um, and it, apropos of, of storage practices and talking to uh, patients, as has been mentioned, the Florida, so-called Florida gag law, FOPA, um, was, a, a, as has already been said, recently decided by the full uh, 11th Circuit, uh, and, uh, in, it's, it, and the, their verdict was the First Amendment applies to speech between a patient and her, uh, and, and her, and, and her clinician. Okay. Um, what about the perceived risk of gun-related violence in this country? We asked the same nationally representative sample, what do you think causes more deaths in your state? Gun suicides, gun homicides, non-gun suicides, non-gun homicides. Most people, two out of three, they're about said, it's gun homicides. It's not. Sort of gun suicides and non-gun suicides way outstripe the number of gun homicides. There were... 22,000 firearm suicides, and about the same number of non-firearm suicides in 2015. There were 13,000 plus firearm homicides, and about 5,000 non-firearm homicides. And yet the public perception, which I don't think surprises many of you, because when I first went into this field, I would have told you that there are many more gun homicides than there are gun suicides. But, but that's, that, that is not the case in 2015, and it hasn't been the case um, at any time over the past sort of several decades since we've begun collecting the data. Okay. I'm going to tell you a little bit about gun owners in the United States, again, based on this survey. About seven out of 10 gun owners report that the primary reason for owning a gun is for protection against strangers, even though the likelihood that that's going to be deployed in that manner is vanishingly small. And the gun is always around in whatever state of storage. Uh, when to, for, uh, and, and that exposure always, always poses some risk. In 1994, the last time that we actually had uh, a good measure of the reason people own gun prior to the 2015 survey, 46% of people said they possessed a, a gun primarily for protection. So it's gone way up, as has the perception that a gun in the home makes it safer. Okay. So... Firearm deaths in the United States in 2015. There are 36,000, as I mentioned, about 22,000 of those are firearms, 13,000 firearm suicides, 13,000 are firearm homicides, and there are about 500 unintentional firearm deaths. About one in three homes in this country contains a firearm. 22% of adults own guns, about 32% about of men and 12% of women. So that means there are about 112 million U.S. adults living in homes with guns and about 25 million children. Of those 25 million children, approximately 5 million, give or take, live in homes where guns are stored, loaded and unlocked. Loaded and unlocked. Um, those are preliminary data, but it, 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 we, we didn't make a mathematical mistake in doing that calculation. Okay. Um, I'm going to skip over the, some of these statistics. I've gone over that or go over them already, if I'm technically capable. Okay, well, obviously, I'm not technically capable because this is a, a, a truncated picture, but I think you can tell that that is supposed, that is the top of the United States. <laughs> and um, you can see the variegated pattern indicating some variation in um, mortality. If I had a PC and it went from PC to PC, you'd see the whole United States in a similar variegated pattern. What that shows is the distribution of suicide rates across the 50 states. Suicide is the 10th leading cause of death in the United States, second leading cause of death among children and young adults. And it varies fourfold across the 50 states. No other leading cause of death, no other top 10 leading cause of death varies anything close to that. Cancer doesn't, heart disease doesn't, motor vehicle crashes don't, not even in the same ballpark. Fourfold differences. And when I speak at Grand Rounds um, to psychiatrists or to medical doctors, and I ask them, what do you think explains this? They usually say, oh, you have a Mac, not a PC. And I said, well, OK, <laughs> just imagine you've got the whole United States there. What, what explains this variation? And they come up with really reasonable explanations for it. There are differences in rates of depression, or anxiety, or PTSD, or substance abuse, or suicidal thoughts, or suicide attempts. That's a very reasonable hypothesis. It's just not, doesn't, doesn't turn out to be the case. 
rates of major depressive disorder, rates of serious psychological distress, rates of suicidal ideation, rates of suicide attempts are no different in Montana than they are in Massachusetts. They're no different uh, in, in, in uh, Louisiana than they are in, in Illinois. Basically, the differences are all noise, and I'll show you that here. This is a slide uh, that's at the, on the Harvard Injury Control Research Center's Means Matter campaign slide. And um, the, the little blue how in the middle of a sea of whys is sort of the analogous question to what physicians in the 1950s started to ask about motor vehicle crashes. Remember, in the 50s, they said not who caused the crash, but what caused the injury. It's a philosophically fascinating question. Why did someone take their own life? It just hasn't gotten us that far in trying to reduce the toll of people dying at their own hand. And so when we start to ask, how did they die? What caused the death? 50% of the time, it's a gun. 20-ish more percent of the time, they've hung themselves. Another 15 to 20% of the time, they've taken pills. And asking that question, what is responsible, allows you to focus on an exposure that you can try to reduce. You can apply an injury prevention paradigm to intentional injuries just as has been applied to unintentional injuries. Okay. So I told you that the suicide rate, this is a graph which just shows you states arrayed from left to right in increasing suicide rates. And you can see rates of serious psychological distress are no different in the high suicide states compared to the low suicide states. You can replace that with rates of attempts, rates of suicidal ideation, major depressive disorder. So how do you explain that difference? How do we explain those differences fourfold, more than any other leading cause of death, despite similar rates of major depressive disorder? Uh, so this is, this, this is a graph that, after I made it up, reminded me of that Sesame Street um, song, that one of these things don't go with the other. And um, I, don't, I think most of you probably, uh, even if you wouldn't join me in singing it, would probably point to the, to the, to the graph with the green dots in the, in, in the left lower quadrant as the one that doesn't fit with the other two. There's really no relationship between the x and the y axis there. Whereas in both the pink dots and the blue dots, um, as you move to the right and the right on the x axis, you move up on the y axis. The um, x-axis here is household gun prevalence. More guns to the right, fewer guns to the left at the state level. Mortality is in the y-axis. The pink dots are firearm mortality. There's a very strong relationship between the ho household firearm prevalence in a state and the rates at which people are dying by gun suicide. The green dots are the relationship between household firearm prevalence and rates at which people are dying by suicide using all other methods combined. It doesn't seem to have, it, you, people are not killing the sums more with other methods in high gun states compared to low gun states. And in this instance, when you combine pink with green, you get blue. The blue is the total suicide rate, which increases, as you can see, very tightly with household firearm ownership. Here's another way of displaying these data using states from the Northeast, um, from which we, um, from my colleagues, Deb Israel and Deb, David Hemingway and I got, got data back in the in the 2000s. Um, as you can see, uh, gun ownership rates are higher in Vermont, Massachusetts, I'm uh, sorry, in Vermont, Maine, and New Hampshire than they are in New Jersey, Massachusetts, and Rhode Island. Rates of suicide are highly correlated with rates of household gun ownership. No difference in rates of non-gun suicide. What drives the relationship between gun ownership and overall suicide is the relationship between gun ownership and firearm suicide. Uh, th this is um, a pie diagram uh, just showing you the distribution of methods used when people die by suicide. Half are guns. We already went over this. About a quarter are hanging and suffocation. About 15% are poisoning. On the other hand, <clears throat> non-fatal acts of deliberate self-harm are overwhelmingly poisonings. And so I don't blame the psychiatrist or the emergency room docs or the primary care docs who, told, who don't think about guns being an important cause of elevated rates of suicide. Because who did they see? They see people who have survived attempts. And they're overwhelmingly people who attempt with methods that are far less lethal, like pills. The likelihood of dying if you shoot yourself is 9 out of 10. 
The likelihood of dying if you take a pill, which is responsible for 85% of non-fatal attempts and about 80% of all attempts, is under 5%. There's a big trade-off in, in the risk when you reach for one as opposed to the other. Okay, so why might restricting access to firearms actually reduce the total number of people who are dying by suicide and not just shift the methods that people use away from firearms and towards something else? There are, there are three well-established clinical observations that sort of undergird this. The first is that suicidal acts are often impulsive and crises often fleeting. The second is that the method that people use is largely dependent on what's readily available during that crisis during that impulse, impulsive moment. Um, and, uh, and the third observation is that for people who survive an attempt, the likelihood that they will go on to die by suicide thereafter is under 10%. Under 10%. That's consequential, because if the likelihood that they would go on and find another way eventually to kill themselves was a lot higher, we wouldn't actually be saving lives in the long run by saving someone's life today. Fewer than 10% who survive today will go on to die by suicide. So if you save someone's life today, you've actually saved their life in the long run. I'm an oncologist by training. When I was at the Dana-Farber, and, and as a fellow, the kind of cancer patient that you most wanted to get as a new patient was someone like Lance Armstrong, who had testicular cancer. Because even when it was widely metastatic, as it was in Lance Armstrong's case, it's curable. The only solid tumor for which we can make that claim, but 90% of the time it was curable. We viewed our testicular cancer patients as patients who had a great prognosis. That is not the way that we tend to look at patients who have survived a suicide attempt, a, a nearly lethal or otherwise uh, uh, medically serious suicide attempt, and yet they have the same prognosis of dying by suicide that Lance Armstrong had of dying by lung cancer, uh, by testicular cancer. All right. Um, I told you that suicidal crises are fleeting. Um, some of the data that point to this, that suggest this, come out of a study uh, among, albeit younger people, 15 to 35-year-olds um, in Houston. And in this study, uh, when people, after people had been stabilized, they were asked, how long did it take between the time you decided, that's it, I'm going to end my life, and the act itself that landed you in the hospital? Not the time between you first thought about killing yourself, but the act itself that landed in the hospital. One out of four people, less than five minutes, that window closed. One out of two, less than 20 minutes. Three out of four, almost three out of four, less than an hour. So what is available to you during that crisis really matters. And the likelihood of dying when you reach for a gun is just enormously higher than the likelihood when you reach for most other things. Okay. Um, this is a, 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 another study of survivors of um, firearm suicide, the one out of 10 who survive. Uh, Two-thirds said that, it, that the, the trigger was a, an interpersonal conflict with a partner. Most described the act as impulsive. Most described the reason that they used the gun that they did as because it was readily available and it was in my home. Okay, we've talked about this. Um, this gives you a sense, this, this is a study that uh, I did with my colleagues, Kathy Barber, Richard White, and Deb Azriel, in which we um, essentially adjusted for rates of suicide attempts across the 50 states, which did nothing because they're no different across the 50 states, and then compared rates of suicide in high gun states to low gun states. That Sesame Street graph sort of is now sort of collapsed into a group of high gun states and a group of low gun states. So you can look instead of at rates at the number of people who are dying in two different populations of the same size. The high gun states, as you can see, had 62 million people uh, in, the, in the high gun states over this two year period, 62 million person years. I can barely see this. Um, so I'm gonna project. So if you look at these, if you look in the high gun states, let's, let's look at adults. How many firearm suicides were there? 7,275 in the high gun states. How about the low gun states? 1,697, 1,700 in firearm suicides. How about non-firearm suicides? 4,100, 4,300, basically no difference. The overall suicide rate was driven by the differences in firearm suicide rate and the net difference for all adults, 11,400 compared to 6,000. And that's just a group of 
tens of states with high gun ownership compared to states with low gun ownership. We're talking about thousands of lives a year in states that don't have higher rates of underlying mental illness or suicidal behavior. There have been over a dozen case control studies that make the same point that I've just made using these area level observations. When you look at and you look at homes where children have died by suicide or adults have died by suicide or women have died by suicide, they're much more likely to be homes that have guns and have guns that are stored uh, unsafely uh, compared to homes of children who are otherwise matched to them, uh, uh, but, but uh, th and are otherwise matched to them. So a gun in the home is a big risk factor for suicide. Um, and you can control for anything that, that, that you want in the analyses and you still find that strong relationship. Um, this is a study by Arthur Kellerman from 1993 uh, in which um, he, he looked at uh, suicide in the home and you can see in, in this study that uh, the way you stored your gun, whether it was loaded or not, made a difference. This is a study by David Grossman looking at homes with guns. Controls had, had guns, cases had guns. What he was interested in is looking among 5 to 19-year-old kids whether the way people who had guns stored their guns made a difference. So he eliminated from, from any consideration the, any differences that might, that might be attributed to people not having, not having guns in their home, just looked at storage practices, and found that um, when you stored your gun loaded or unlocked, your risk of suicide um, was considerably higher two or three-fold higher. So I've shown you case control studies. I've shown you ecologic studies. These are um, studies from outside of the United States that try to address the question, does restricting access to highly lethal, culturally acceptable methods that people use in suicide attempts, can that actually save lives? And there are a couple of uh, stories that are worth knowing about. The first one has been called the coal gas story, first described by Kreitman in 1976. Um, the, back in the 1950s, if half of all suicides in, uh, uh, in the UK were carbon monoxide poisonings, put your head in the oven and die, half of all. Then um, for reasons that had nothing to do with an intention to reduce suicide, the carbon monoxide concentration in the kind of heating systems that, that heated homes in, in the UK dropped to non-toxic levels. This is a graph of what happened to the percentage of carbon monoxide in domestic gas. It dropped to non-toxic levels, and coincident with that, what you had is a fall in carbon monoxide suicides with no change, uh, no appreciable change in non-carbon monoxide suicides. The net effect, several thousand lives fewer were several thousand lives, uh, fewer lives were lost to suicide by the 1970s compared to the, the, the mid-50s. In Sri Lanka, the agricultural, agricultural revolution um, raised the, 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 the standards of living in that country considerably, but with it came highly toxic pesticides, pesticides that um, were so toxic that they, they wouldn't be sold in any Western country or, or in the United States. And with the Green Revolution came an increase in the number of suicides, such that Sri Lanka became a country that had suicide rates that were as high as any other country in the world, in the top 1%. And what happened was the rates of suicide increased, um, uh, suicides by pesticides increased. Thanks to work by Michael Edelson and, uh, by Michael uh, Edelson and David Cannell and others, the policies were passed to ban some of the most toxic class 1 WHO pesticides in the 90s. Coincident with those bans, the pesticide suicide rate dropped. The non-pesticide suicide rate didn't change. And you had an enormous drop, a two-fold decrease in suicide rates for the country as a whole, banning the most toxic pesticides. Those are their guns. Half of all suicides were pesticide suicides. In the Israeli Defense Force, um, the, the suicide rate among young Israelis had, uh, had increased by the mid-2000s, and, the, and what they did is they went to their data. They looked, where are these people dying? What were they dying from? They were dying on weekends from firearm uh, uh, suicides. So they told the Israeli soldiers, leave your guns on base over the weekend. And the suicide rate dropped uh, uh, right after the implementation of that policy um, by 40%. Uh, all of it attributable to a drop in gun suicides on weekends. Small study, 
but a purposeful intervention. Okay. Um, Emmy Betts, Dr. Betts and I, along with our colleague Kathy Barber, uh, did a study where we asked healthcare providers what they, uh, wh whether they thought that means restriction would work, whether reducing access to guns would work. And this is the question that we put to them. Um, each month in the United States, about 1,000 people die by suicide using firearms. Had a firearm not been accessible to them, how many do you think would have found another way to die by suicide? And we gave them choices. All of them would have found a way, most of them, some of them, few of them. It turns out that about 5% of physicians and 12% of nurses said it wouldn't have saved a single life. Two-thirds of nurses said most people would have died anyway, and about half of physicians did as well. We put a question uh, prior to this uh, to Americans in general, saying, had a foolproof barrier been an original architectural feature of the Golden Gate Bridge, how many of the more than 1,600 people who had jumped to their death do you think would have um, found another way to kill themselves? And we gave them the same categories. All of them would have, most would have, some would have, few would have. One out of three Americans thinks that if you had a foolproof barrier on the Golden Gate Bridge, which is the leading suicide site in the world, 30 people jump from the bridge every year thereabouts. And, and have since it opened its gates in 1937. One out of three people said every single person would have found another way. Another 40% said most would. This brings us back to the slide um, about suicide risk and the perception in, in, the, uh, in the general population. 15% of people think that it increases the risk of suicide. 6% of gun owners, 20% of people who don't live in homes with guns. I'm afraid that it's not a lot better when you ask health practitioners. Now, this is a gross category of anyone who self-identified as in the health field. Uh, and so um, if this doesn't mean it's doctors, social workers, nurses, we don't know. But people who identify as being in, in, the, in the healthcare field, tw uh, only 25% said that a gun in the home increased the risk of suicide. And even if you take into account sort of the extremes of our confidence interval, more than half of all physicians said that a gun in the home did not agree that a gun in the home increased the risk of suicide. And you can see that 50% affirmatively disagreed that it did of, of clinicians. Not surprisingly, when my prolific friend, Dr. Betts, and I, and Kathy Barber, did another study, and we asked, um, unless I'm double dipping here for the same study, uh, another we asked providers what they did when they had a suicidal patient in front of them in the ED. Two out of three said that if, there, if that patient who came in for a suicidal crisis was no longer suicidal, they didn't ask about guns. Is that right? No, sorry. What, sorry, if they, if they had a plan and it was with the gun, two out of three asked. If they had a plan and they said, I'm I have a plan and I'm going to use a gun, two out of three asked. One out of three didn't. If they said, I have a plan with pills, or I have a plan to hang myself, or I don't have a plan, but I'm still suicidal, only one out of five talked to their patients about guns. This is... Um, a picture of, of uh, Ulysses who's bound, bound himself to a mast on a ship. And he did so because he knew that other sailors had perished had, because the, the siren's call was so compelling that they drove their ship into the rocks. He anticipated that at some point he would run into a problem that he could not deal with on his own and took uh, to, 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 took steps to avoid disaster, not because the calls of the sirens were any less compelling to him than, or, than, than to others, but because he limited his ability to act in a, in a lethal manner um, on his, uh, when, when the sirens arrived. So I'm going to um, just close uh, paying tribute to uh, the, the work that this uh, uh, body has done in helping the 11th Circuit arrive at their wise decision that the First Amendment applies to the speech between patients and uh, and 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 cl and patients and their and their doctors. And sort of given that right, I just want to emphasize that uh, professional norms 
require sort of that we own up to that responsibility. It, we're not likely to honor this sort of hard-won victory by exercising our First Amendment rights because legal impediments were never the chief impediments to speaking with patients, right? There are others that we need to understand better. And Emmy and Megan have done some really good work in that area, but we have a lot more to learn about why those clinicians are not, taking, are not asking their patients about firearms. And we need to know how to help them ask in a way that's more, um, more, more effective. Uh, so the court uh, has done its duty. It's, uh, it's now uh, the physician's turn. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Miller. Uh, we have about uh, eight or ten minutes for, uh, for questions and answers. If you will pass along your cards to the center aisle to pick them up and bring them in. Uh, and while we're waiting on that, uh, if you do have a question, send them to the center aisle. And uh, while we're here, let, let me just ask a question to start things here. What can we do? I mean, we hear people say, I get a gun to make myself safer, guns in the home to keep us safer. And we've heard and seen your, the, the studies. What can we do to better inform the public, to better inform clinicians uh, of the risks that are there? Um, it's, a, it, it's a good question. I think we need to first get a better idea. So what, what, are, what do people think? You know, what, what do patients think beyond answering the simple question, do you think a home is safer or not? In our study, um, it, well, we, we actually asked uh, whether, whether people felt that the home was, home was safer or less safe um, uh, with a gun in it. Or, and, and half of the patients in our survey said it depends. 25% said it was more dangerous. 25% said it roughly that it was less dangerous. That is in contrast with the Gallup polls where today... 60-something percent think that the gun makes, makes the home safer, much more than in the past. Um, but I'm curious to have follow-up questions about what, what does it depend on? Like, what, what is going into your calculation that a gun in the home makes it safer? And what is it that I can tell you or someone else can tell you that might shift sort of the way you come down on that? Uh, you know, and, and are there other th – and let's say it's providing – a need? Is there something that I can offer you in exchange that will serve the purpose that the gun is serving um, without imposing uh, the same sort of risk? But we, we have a lot of work to do, qualitative, thoughtful, methodologically sound work with physicians and, uh, and with patients to understand what goes into their decision making. Let me uh, look through these for a second. Any um Uh, any comments on whether there's a relation between the access to firearms uh, and a connection with uh, deaths, homicide deaths, uh, from domestic violence, for instance, in the home? Okay. So um, I was afraid that you weren't going to add that last clause because <laughs> the, the data, as I said, the data is really strongest for the relationship between guns in the home and firearm accidents and suicide. But when it comes to a homicide of women in domestic violence situations, it's, it's, it's quite strong as well. What's less easy to uh, uh, assert with as much confidence is the relation between a gun in the home and the risk of homicide for men. Um, that, that is a, a more difficult, uh, uh, that's a more difficult question to answer because um, the, the potential to own, well, b b the data are just not as, as, not as firm. Uh, uh, with, but as far as domestic violence is concerned, yes, the, the data are very strong. Uh, is there, uh, you've talked about a certain amount of research. We have heard uh, that the, the restrictions on the CDC, for instance, in conducting research, uh, is there research that needs to be done uh, in this area? And what can we do uh, in addition to advocating for federal funds for research, what can we do to encourage more research? 
So there is, I mean, so yes, advocate for more funds from federal agencies, um, the Joyce Foundation, and a, a very small number of private philanthropic organizations have tried to step into the breach to keep some of us sort of breathing. Uh, but if you compare the, and I know that, that Emmy is going to mention something about the, the funding, um, so I'll, I'll leave it to her to go into the details, but the, the amount of money spent on injury in general compared to the amount of money spent on medical care is sort of, is, is shamefully small given the toll of injury deaths compared to medical deaths. And within the injury field, so it, uh, on public health compared to medicine, when you then look within public health, the injury field gets a tiny amount of money. And then within the injury field itself, the amount of money spent on guns is, is, is smaller still. Um, so advocating for more, for more research uh, through government group, th federal funding or private funding um, could help sort of me encourage young graduate students to actually go into this field instead of warding them away because the funding streams just can't support that many people. I'm looking at some handwriting here. I'm, uh, give me a second to decipher. You need a um, pharmacist. <laughs> um, uh, in looking at uh, suicide and gun ownership, uh, does, do the studies look at the percentage that have undergone safety programs? Um, n no, but, but I'll answer a related question. If we look at how people store their guns, those who report having had formal firearm training are less likely to store their guns safely. They're also less likely to think that a gun increases the risk of suicide. One of the ways that we can actually make progress is to perhaps standardize what we teach people when they take firearm-related courses. Right now, the NRA runs most of those courses, and, um, and, and, and the, uh, the curricula has not really been vetted by um, by public health and injury prevention scientists. There, we're making progress in that area. There are people who are doing that. Kathy Barber is doing a wonderful job making inroads, um, but there's a, there's a long way to go. Uh, do we know, I know there are uh, certain states that have, uh, have enacted laws about safe storage of weapons. Do we know? Uh -huh. if, if there is an okay. observed effect? So there are some, of the, some of the laws that you might be referring to are called child access prevention laws. Um, and there are some studies done by, uh, by my overstudy, as someone put it, uh, Dr. Webster and his group, uh, that have looked at child access prevention laws and seen a, a, a trend towards some benefit but marginal and very dependent on the model that you use to evaluate that. Uh, in terms of reducing firearm sui uh, suicide overall, uh, laws like child access prevention laws, while well intended, may, it may depend on the educational campaign that accompanies them. Because look, the way you store your gun, I am not going to observe that. It's opaque to, to observation. And when we did a study back in 2000 and, uh, what year is this? 2000 and this is 17. That was 2004. We asked people if they lived in a state that had a child access prevention law. And guess what? Everyone thought that they did because who, what state wouldn't have a child access prevention law? So the, the disconnect between the perceptions that people have about whether there is a law and the law itself make me wonder whether there was something else about the way the laws were enforced or, um, or, or or, or um, promulgated, and those data are really sensitive to leaving Florida in the, the, the observations or not. Uh, one, one other question, um, and then we'll have to stop this. Uh, uh, is there a relationship that's been studied between physicians asking or educating about household firearm safety and reduced gun injuries? And reduce, reduced gun injuries. Um, or deaths. Or deaths. I, I was hoping you're going in the other direction, uh, towards like safer storage. Uh, no, um, it's it's still it's still a rare outcome. You need a really big study to see changes in mortality. Um, but what what we're doing, for example, in a, in a study in Colorado, is uh, counseling 
mental health practitioners at different emergency departments to talk to parents of kids who come in with a suicidal crisis or a mental health crisis. And they're being trained to talk to the parents to see if the parents are willing to get to, to remove the gun from the home or to at least store the gun more safely. Uh, this is a, a study that Dr. Betts and I and, and our colleagues um, in Colorado and at Harvard are, are just rolling out. Um, but we're not looking at mortality. We're looking at whether it affected changes in the way parents stored their guns or whether they kept guns at home, sort of a proxy uh, for um, what we assume would translate into benefit. If you're going to see an effect, you're going to have to have an enormous cohort a cohort like, say, of the entire group of veterans, if there was a coordinated rollout of an intervention, a suicide prevention intervention focusing on firearm among veterans, seven out of 10 of suicides among veterans are firearm suicides. So if you could intervene to reduce access across all of the VA and follow people for five years, you might actually be able to see a difference in mortality. Maybe you could see that in a large military cohort, but... Um, the numbers, we won't be able to look at mortality in, in, in most of the studies that are being done. Thank you. You're welcome.